to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was. Sabbath and good afternoon. Welcome to Tarsell Ministry Worship Services. Glad that you're able to join us today. And at this time, we're going to start with our opening prayer. Let's pray. Eternal Father in heaven, loving Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for setting aside a day for us to be able to be able to remember our Creator, to come to you for worship, to come for you for communion to come for you to extend our love and our gratitude for all your many blessings that you have bestowed upon to each heart. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us time and opportunity to be able to appreciate your blessings and to be able to, most importantly, open up your word. And on this day, we pray that you will bless the Sabbath, these services, that you will be with our pastor, that you would help him, Lord, with all the technology and all the words that you have given him to be able to comprise a message so that we may be able to hear from you. You who sit at the heavenly throne. And we ask, Lord, that we would be able to meditate, to be able to grow, to be able to learn and understand your message. We each have a very critical role to play in these last days. Show us exactly, Lord, what we need to know so that we can do all we can to stay in the Father's will. We thank you for hearing us this morning, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we'll have our opening song. It is titled, Here is the Patience of the Saints. commandments of God and the faith of 
At this time, we're going to do our scripture reading, and it comes from the book of James, James chapter 2, verses 26. But before we read the scripture, we're going to pray. Father, as we open up your word on this afternoon, we ask that your spirit will come and abide with us. Teach us what we need to know. For we ask for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to be granted to each of us. For all is prayed and asked in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 2, verses 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. At this time, we will have our song and meditation. And it is titled, Wherefore He is Able. This time we'll hear from our pastor speak on how to ruin a church. Pastor? Amen. Well, we need to know how to ruin it so we know what not to do. Sometimes we can learn lessons, right, from what not to do. Um, sometimes when you see somebody doing something wrong and you say, well, I'm learning what not to do. That's what kind of message this is today. Um, but we're going to take a journey in the Bible. And we're going to see how God sees the end from the beginning. And he has seen the church in its different phases. And he has made predictions. We're going to look at those today. As we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you will speak to us, not just so that we can look at others, but that we might look at ourselves to be able to uh, compare our lives with yours and where we need to come up higher. We pray that you'll give us the strength in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
The first way that you can ruin a church is by introducing idolatry. Introducing idolatry. Now, brothers and sisters, we might not bow down to a statute as some do, um, but we need to ask ourselves, is there anything in our lives that we put ahead of Christ? Because that is idolatry. And we have an obligation, not just to ourselves, but to our families and not just to our families, but to the body of Christ. So you have to get closer to Christ. You owe that to me. I hope you understand what God is saying. You have to get closer to Christ. You owe that to me. And I have to get closer to Christ. I owe that to you, my brothers and sisters. This is talking about once you see that the body of Christ was like a collective body with the Jewish church. The Jewish church had two divisions and um, that was done at the time of Solomon because Rehoboam got bad counsel and he chose to be evil and hard on the people as his father Solomon was. And so God raised up Jeroboam to separate the church into the two kingdoms. He would take the northern kingdom with 10 tribes, and then Judah had two tribes that would be Judah and Benjamin in the southern part of the kingdom. And this is where idolatry came in, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, and Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You know, sometimes what we do is we find good reasons to compromise. We find good reasons to do the wrong thing. Brothers and sisters, the end does not justify the means with God. We must do everything God has said in the manner that God has said it. And even though we might fear people not coming to our church or joining our Sabbath school class or doing whatever, we are not to resort to methods that are ungodly in order to keep uh, whatever we are afraid of losing. And so we have to make sure that deep down inside we're surrendered. You know, another word for mature is surrender. Did you know that? Sometimes you, when you see how little children act and how they fight and they fuss and they get jealous and envious and want all the attention, we have that same thing. We're like little kids as adults. We need to overcome that. Spiritual maturity is called surrender, friends. We need to surrender. The temptation will always come. You all might remember, some of you all, if not all, were listening this morning, and we learned about how the principle of he must increase and I must decrease has many applications. It applies to, yes, we must decrease so Christ can increase. But it even applies to when God's cause is better serviced by something, someone else um, that can do something. And my time for doing that is over or in my time in this jurisdiction or in this venue and somebody else needs to take the helm. I should do all I can to uphold them and, 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 and allow their influence to be a positive influence. But that's not what you see. You see fighting and bickering and you see people dragging others with their tongue down, downward so that um, people lose confidence. We should say, I must decrease so this person who's walking with God can increase. You know, I think often of how sometimes a pastor has to go maybe to a different church, a different district, you know, the right thing for the pastor who's leaving that district, even if he didn't like the fact that he has to leave is to decrease so the other might increase. Amen. So brothers and sisters, Jeroboam had idols set up. So the children of Israel and the Bible from that point on always made reference to that Jeroboam who made Israel to sin. Jeroboam who made Israel to sin. It was very serious with God. Do your own homework. Check out that phrase. 
who made Israel to sin. All right. So that took place in 974 BC. Now, you know, when the BCs of time, they count downward toward one. And then in the ADs of time, we count upward from one to 2024. So this is a scripture. I've mentioned this before, but it's good to, to repeat because a lot of times when we've studied the um, principles of um, the day year principle, as we study Bible prophecy, we usually quote Ezekiel 4, 6, but I believe we should be quoting Ezekiel 4, 1 through 5 as well. And I will tell you the reason why we quote six is because most people don't understand what the prophecy is saying. Okay. Notice what it says in the Bible. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city and set thy face against it and it shall be besieged and thou shalt lay siege against it. We're going to see brothers and sisters uh, God allowed the church to come under siege more than once because of its apostasy. This shall be assigned to the house of Israel. Remember, there was Israel and there was Judah. Both of those collectively made the Jewish church. This was Israel's sign. Lie thou also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days Thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquities. Now, this is important. It said, lie thou also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days that, that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquities. And look at verse 5. That's why I believe we should be studying this along with verse 6. For I have laid upon thee the years... So he was to illustrate it in days, but it would be, I have laid upon the, uh, the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days. So shall thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So what he was saying is from the point that they would have their great iniquity, it would be 390 years before Jerusalem would be under siege. Now, brothers and sisters, Jeroboam, made Israel to sin in 974 BC, okay? If you then go 390 years later, you're at 574 BC, what happened then? The temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Let's see if he used the method of a siege. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and this is Daniel 1, verses 1 and 2, for those of you who are uh, on the phone calls, and can't see the slides. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to be an instrument to punish the children of Israel because of the idolatry which was introduced in the time of Jeroboam, 390 years before. God said in the Bible, remember the former things of old, for I am the Lord and there is none else. I am God. I am God. There is none else. Um, there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, nine and 10. We authenticate God or God authenticates himself by telling us at the beginning what's going to happen at the end. Brothers and sisters, no movement has a such a clear understanding of prophecy as do seventh day Adventist. Unfortunately, 
we have been besieged, brothers and sisters, but it's often a self-made besieging. You know, we, we state, whenever you state to yourself and you just witness to those in your own church and you don't go out and do outreach, you have a self-imposed besieging. Let's get unbesieged, brothers and sisters. Nobody's forcing us not to give a track to our neighbor. Nobody's forcing us not to say hello and do medical missionary work and try to help people. We have a self-imposed besieging and we need to get out of that. The devil doesn't even have to do anything. We besiege ourselves and we are keeping uh, the work from moving forward. The work has to move forward, friends. And a lot of times we think we have to wait on a conference or wait on a church or wait on a pastor or wait on a group. Now, I believe in being organized and I believe in uh, doing things together collectively and doing things decently and in order. But there is a personal work for everybody to do. And we need to go out and work the works of God. But here we see Israel, which was part of the Jewish church, sinned. And how do you ruin a church? Number one, you bring in idolatry. And then 390 years later, God made a prophecy at that time. Um, at some point later, God made a prophecy that they would be 390 years from that point to the point that Jerusalem would be besieged and destroyed. Okay. It happened just like God said it. So friends, because God is such a God of control, being in control, not a controlling God, he's in control. Um, controlling has a negative context. He, he, he does require obedience, but when you think of a controlling person, they, they're doing it. It, it has a selfish motive usually uh, associated with that. God doesn't have any selfish motives. He wanted what was best for us. He created us to be the best and he created the best for the best for us. And it is sin that has caused us to choose the worst over the best. And the plan of redemption restores the best and replaces the worst with the best. Amen. So which one will you choose? That's either going to be sin, which is worse, or righteousness, which is best. Praise God. Let's keep going in our sermon today, brothers and sisters. The second way to ruin a church is to reject Christ. Now, of course, we're going to look at the kingdom of Judah here, and we're going to see what they did. But you also have to look at what brought them to that point. I highly recommend that you review um, Desire of Ages, the chapters we've read earlier in our talks in the morning. Um, we're told that the high priest's office was secured by bribery, fraud, and even murder. We know that from history, um, even back in the time between Malachi and Matthew, we know from history that they made a league with Rome. The Jews made a league with Rome down in the back in the period of the Maccabees. There's no scripture written about it, um, but history records it. When I say there's no scripture written about it, the only scripture that would allude to it would be Daniel 11. Daniel 11 has the closest and most accurate um, depiction and history of what happened uh, between Malachi and Matthew, along with other points in time. Okay. So the children of Israel, uh, they made leagues with Rome because they were uh, trying to overthrow another kingdom that was the kingdom of uh, Medo-Persia that was, uh, or Greece rather, I believe that was um, uh, afflicting them. It's not good to make a league with Rome, brothers and sisters. God's people were to stand alone. We weren't supposed to have any kind of binding contracts with those not of our faith. Even when a church takes money from the government to fund its hospitals, that's a binding contract. That's why when a pandemic comes along, that church is more tempted to follow man instead of following God. Because uh, one church in particular, uh, we, we understand, has received for its hospitals around $20 million a year. So the love of money is the root of all evil. Rather than securing for its people the liberties of conscience um, and, and, and allowing them to keep their jobs by helping with letters uh, to show that this is part of our religious faith, um, they said, no, there's nothing in the Bible or inspiration that would keep us from this particular uh, movement uh, that is being forced upon people. And so people died. People lost their jobs. We're talking about how we reject Christ. It's a slow, steady process downward, my friends. And we have to be faithful to God at all times. And regardless of what might happen, you know, in that book, Desire of Ages, I love a phrase that says, the Christian asks two questions. What is God's command and what his promise? Knowing these, he will obey the one 
and trust the other. That's what it is. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's the Christian walk. That's the mature Christian walk, the surrendered Christian walk. Notice, they rejected Christ. They decided to kill him after um, Lazarus was raised from the dead. This is John chapter 11, the, the, the story of Lazarus, and this is their reaction to the raising of Lazarus. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Look, if we've got to kill one, even though murder is wrong, we might have to just compromise and let one go so that the whole nation doesn't perish. Brothers and sisters, that's compromise. And so that was when they made a decision to kill Christ. They didn't like him anyway, but they made a concerted decision. He must die. They rejected Christ, but you can't not, you don't reject Christ in a moment. You don't reject Christ. It's a slow process of compromise until your rejection is final, my brothers and sisters. So let's stop compromising. Let's stop compromising in our home. Wives, stop compromising. Be good wives. Husbands, stop compromising. Be good husbands. Church members, one to another. Let's be good brothers and sisters to one another and not jealous of one another. Okay? Because any deviation from strict integrity will lead you to a full rejection of Christ. So, Christ died in the first part of A.D. 31. So they killed him. They committed their iniquity. Remember how Israel committed its iniquity in 974 B.C. Uh, when they caused Israel to sin, Jeroboam. Then 390 years later, Jerusalem was destroyed. Well, this is now Judah. By the time Jerusalem was destroyed, the only kingdoms left were pretty much Judah and Benjamin. Although it's called Israel, it was really the kingdom of Judah. So during the time of Christ, the survivors, that was primarily the kingdom of Judah. And their sin was to murder the Savior of the world. So notice what the Bible says in Matthew 27, 31 to 35. And after that, they mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did they cast lots. You will remember in that story, brothers and sisters, that Pilate wanted to release Jesus and he said he found no fault. And then he said, well, whom shall I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. He chose the most heinous criminal, knowing that they would choose Jesus over Barabbas. They chose Barabbas over Jesus. And they said, let him be crucified. So don't be a fool. Don't be fooled. It is the Jews, although the Roman army did it, it was the Jews that crucified Jesus, friends. That was Judah's sin. That was done in the Passover time. That corresponds with March and April. So you have plenty of months in the year. So when you study time prophecies and things like this, we use a principle called inclusive reckoning. So this was not at the end of the year. This was in the first part of the year. So when you're counting 40 years after, remember, Ezekiel is going to tell us that he had to lay on his right side for 40 days, simplifying, exemplifying rather, 40 years. Let's read it. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So 
AD 31 would be counted because there was still a portion of that year left. And if you count 40 years starting with AD 31, you get actually, you get exactly to AD 70. And what happened in AD 70, brothers and sisters? Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus, the general of Rome. This is what Jesus said about it in Luke 19, 40 to 44, 41 to 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. You know, I love this. It, Jesus shows us the attitude we should have even about an apostate church. He wept over it. Friends, when you see somebody doing wrong, are you weeping? If you're not, ask Jesus to give you more of his spirit. You know, we read that we can receive the spirit of Jesus without measure. You can be full of the Holy Ghost. You can. You should say, I can be full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the Holy Ghost. So that no room for any other spirit. Everything you say will be from God. Everything you think will be from God. You're constantly in prayer and communion with him. You sense your need of him. You, you're, you're, you're pained uh, when you see uh, people mistreated and you would never mistreat anybody yourself if you're full of the Holy Ghost. If you have bitter and resentment in your heart, you need more of the Holy Ghost. Saying, if thou hast known, this is Jesus talking, even thou, in at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even to the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The time of their visitation was Jesus, and he was prophesied to come and be baptized in A.D. 27. You can read that prophecy in Daniel 8 and 9. They didn't know the time because they weren't studying the prophecies. My brothers and sisters, just as Jesus had predicted, 40 years simplified, exemplified, or portrayed by 40 days by Ezekiel lying on his right side, Jerusalem would again be besieged and be destroyed. The third way that you can ruin a church is to apostatize from the truth. You see, the Jewish church became Babylon. The Bible says it this way, how has the faithful city become a harlot? And then God set up the Christian church through the apostles. We don't believe in apostolic succession, meaning Peter would be the first pope and the others would lead on and then, of course, leading to the popes of Rome. No, Peter would not allow Cornelius, read Acts chapter 10, to worship him. He said, get up, I am just a man. So Peter refused the homage that the pope demands. Peter refused the homage that the pope demands. He was not the first pope. Matthew 16, when he said, when the Bible says, Jesus himself said, upon this rock will I build my church. He was talking about himself because the subject of the of the of the conversation was whom do men say that I am and who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, yes, you've answered correctly. I'm going to change your name to Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter means pebble. The, rock, the word rock means the large rock. And Peter said in second Peter that Christ was the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. When they build a building, you start with the cornerstone. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The Apostle Paul understood that the church would go away from God's word, the Christian church, and would bring in traditions. Great controversy says the result was the papacy. The Apostle Paul warned us of this. He said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Friends, the Christian church fell away, and it became Babylon as the Roman Catholic Church. 
Of course, God raised up the Protestant church. But friends, we see that idolatry, rejecting Christ, and apostasy. And when you think about it, they kind of go like that. You know, when you put something above Christ, which is an idol, then you reject Christ. And that is apostasy from the truth. These are the ways that you can ruin a church. God set up the Protestant Reformation, brothers and sisters. And the Protestant Reformation um, was a, 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 a church, okay? It was a church movement that God set up. But since we've been showing predictions of the fall of a church that went into apostasy, let's keep with that theme. In Revelation chapter 17, we actually have in verse uh, 17 and 18, we're told what's going to happen to the papacy. Let's read verses 1 and verse 6 here of Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Verse 18, 7 and 8, 11 and 16. This is still a continuation of the previous chapter, and it tells us what will eventually happen to the papacy. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow. That basically means I'm married to Christ. No, you're not. You rejected Christ and shall see no sorrow. Therefore, this is what's going to happen shall her plagues come sorry then shall her plagues come in one day death and mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire now there's different interpretations i believe that we we have other scriptures that speak of that come after this where it talks about how um heaven was emptied for the space of half an hour and when you look at that based on the day year principle that would end up being about um I think it's about two weeks or it's a little over a week. I'm sorry. It's a little over a week, which would line up with Jesus coming and then another seven day trip to heaven because we can't go to heaven unless we keep all the commandments. So even people who never, never learned about the Sabbath, but they lived up to the light they had, they will keep their first Sabbath on their way to glory. Okay. So uh, a little over a week is the space of half an hour. So that's why I believe that this, um, day in the Bible um, is actually a period of time um, that's not a literal day, like a 24-hour day. There are others um, that believe it is an actual 24-hour day, um, and that's fine. We're not making a big point of that. I'm just telling you why I believe. And I'm not remembering. I seem like this is a roughly uh, um, two-week period of time or something like that. I forgot exactly what it is if you use the day-year principle. Obviously, a, a 24-hour day, I'm sorry, 24 hours, um, which is one day would be one year. So you would have to uh, divide 365 um, into by 24, and then you would learn what this, and then once you got one day, um, you would divide that by, now I'm not saying it right, so let's see, how would you figure this out? If I can remember, I'll try to remember it quickly. So you would actually, we know that one day equals a year, which is 360 days. I'm sorry, 360 days is one year. That's one day. So since this is one day, then, oh, that's easy. Okay, so if her plagues come in one day, that means within a year, all of these things would happen. I was getting, I was overthinking it. Sometimes that's what we do, isn't it? We overthink things. Um, the plagues come in one day. So within a year, um, this these plagues would come upon the papacy. It says, uh, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord who judges her. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise any more. And saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. 
So the papacy is going to be destroyed, friends, and think they have destroyed and tried to destroy uh, many a person. They have definitely taken the lives of many, but these martyrs will be saved, those who gave their hearts to Christ. What about apostate Protestants? They'll have the same fate. And I heard another voice uh, from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins that ye receive not of her plagues. So the plagues come to the people who are also um, apostate Protestant. Why do we say apostate Protestant? Because the Protestant motto was the Bible, the Bible only is our rule of faith and practice. So you have to go outside of the Bible in order to be in apostasy. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled fill her double how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her for she saith in her heart i sit a queen and am no widow we read this already and shall see no sorrow therefore shall her plagues come in one day death and mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the lord god who judgeth her so if we don't come out of false teachings uh, brothers and sisters, we receive the same plagues. I'm going to uh, switch over to the spirit of prophecy because there is a prophecy given by the Lord to the servant of the Lord regarding a direction that the general conference was going in. And I'm going to read it. It's in second, first selected messages 204. It tells us what will happen to the general conference of Seventh-day Adventists. The enemy of souls, if it goes in a particular direction, and unfortunately, it has. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition, that's a lie, that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. That has happened, brothers and sisters. There is a movement. You can actually graduate and become a pastor and not actually believe that the uh, mark of the beast is Sunday, that the beast is the papacy. You don't have to believe that anymore uh, to to graduate under certain professors in Adventist seminaries. Um, doctrines are changing. Even seasoned pastors are writing in our publications and teaching that that was old school teaching and that's not valid today. There's the doctrine of the Trinity. And although I believe in three separate beings, the Trinity doctrine is Roman Catholic. We should have never adopted that. It means it means one being who can manifest itself in three ways. And if you listen, if you read carefully the 28 fundamental beliefs, it'll talk about the triune God and it'll call him he. OK, instead of them, you see, it's one God being he. So just the wording of it suggest Roman Catholicism, even though many people still believe and teach that there are three beings. We should never have called that the Trinity. That is a change in doctrine. Ellen White says our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. What were those fundamental principles? One was the medical missionary work in line with the gospel. That is accounted as error. Therefore, the medical profession went its way went for the money and uh, the pastoral work went for the power and influence in the church. They have not, they have been severed. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. You know, get your degree, get your PhD, get your master's, get your bachelor's. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders in this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. That is the prophecy of the general conference if it goes in this direction and it has storm and tempest would sweep away the structure that's not talking about katrina that's not you know i'm talking about the hurricane katrina that's not talking about any of the other hurricanes that have come and gone 
That's not talking about a tornado. That's talking about the Sunday law movement, brothers and sisters. Okay. It hasn't happened yet, but God has told us when it happens, the general conference will not remain. At least it won't remain faithful when it's swept away. It could mean swept away into keeping Sunday. Okay. Um, but it will not be the final church that we know. So the final church, therefore, cannot be an or this organization. It is faithful people. That's why God called it a remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is the spirit of prophecy. The prophecy of all Adventists who do not treat each other with love. What is the prophecy about them? What's going to happen? That's Laodicea because the gold tried in the fire is faith and love. There's a lack of love. There's a lack of faith in the church and a lack of love, brothers and sisters. We don't love each other the way God says we should. And that's Laodicea. What does the Bible say about it? So then because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Those who do not follow Christ all the way and are faithful and have love and faith will be spewed out. That means they will not be saved. That means that they in their, their probation will close with sin still on their record. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye sound, that thou mayest see. Brothers and sisters, we have different ways of worship. Some are in uh, organizations that can use the name Seventh-day Adventist. And I'm here to tell you, there's a lack of love in those organizations, brothers and sisters, that I have seen, that I have seen and have experienced. And unless there's repentance, they're not going to make it. So I have come to the conclusion there's not going to be an organization that contains the name Seventh-day Adventist, but we will all hold on to that name. That will be the organization that is going through to the end. I just don't see Christ uh, manifested the way he should, brothers and sisters. Now, many of us are in other ministries. Um, Torso is a ministry. If we don't stay faithful, we will meet this condemnation. By the grace of God, I'm not going to have this written about me. How about you, brothers and sisters? Because you're part of the ministry, too. We're not going to have this written about us. We're going to have faith in God and do his commandments. And we're going to love one another. We're not going to be jealous of each other's talents, um, jealous because somebody can do something and they're talented. We're not going to say, oh, he's come in and taken over. He's trying to take over. And the reality is the person who's talking about people and doing that snake like work, he's the one that wants the high position and he's judging and doing the same thing. You see, by the way, it's not wrong to want a position. Did you know that? The Bible says, he that desireth the office of a bishop. If you have a gift and you want to use that for the Lord, that's like wanting to sing. It's nothing wrong with that. But we have to be humble and we have to let the Lord. Promotion cometh not from the east or from the west, the Bible says. But you see, God sometimes doesn't count worthy certain um, organizations, certain situations, and certain people if we're not faithful to God. So, there's still time. There's still time to repent. If you're in an organization such as I mentioned, there's time to repent. There's time to give your heart to God. Go to people who you mistreated because God requires that and apologize and stop doing that snake-like work, slithering behind people's back, talking about them and judging them and putting your own spin on things that is an evil spin. You're guilty of evil thinking. Oh, my brothers and sisters, we have to have our hearts right with God. Some of us are in marriages and, you know, we're not in a good marriage. Brothers and sisters, give your heart to God. Stop looking at your spouse. Look at yourself and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And when we start getting filled with the Holy Ghost, whew, it has power. John had power. John the Baptist, he was full of the Holy Ghost. Jesus had power because he was full of the Holy Ghost. You might save your own marriage if you get full of the Holy Ghost. My brothers and sisters, let's be like Jesus. I love that song. Be like Jesus. This my song in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. 
Our appeal song is Reach Out and Touch by Jacqueline Brooks Winston and Charles. You know, brothers and sisters, uh, John 13, 35 is very insightful. It says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Indeed, if you have love one toward another. And, you know, we need to have love. We think about doctrines. We think about prophecies that we need to know. But God says, what really makes people know that you're my disciples is if you love one another. Friends, let's do more outreach. It could be, ask God to show you somebody's lonely this next week, maybe today even. Somebody that could just use a call, use a text, a visit, a little gift. Somebody that you might know could be hungry. Maybe you know somebody in a nursing home. You know, maybe you know somebody in jail. Let's try to visit and work and do and help and minister to those, particularly those less fortunate to, than us. That's what really shows. By this shall all men know. Didn't say that you know the 2300 days. Didn't say you know all the Bible and spirit of prophecy. By this shall all men know 
that you are my disciples indeed, if you have love one toward another. One common denominator, if Jeroboam loved the people, he would have never gone into idolatry. If the Jewish people loved the people, the leaders loved the people, they would have never encouraged the people to cry, crucify him, crucify him, and reject Christ. If the Christian church loved the people, they would have never compromised and become the papacy. If the Protestants loved the people, they would never have gone away from the Bible, the Bible only. And if Seventh-day Adventists really love, we would not have gone into apostasy in various doctrines and standards and education, medical, all of that. We've not lived up to the standard because we don't love one another. And even those who claim to believe the present truth, we talk about each other, we take up a reproach, we judge one another's motives. We're so far from the mark, yet we think we have something great and we don't. Friends, you just have a name. If all you have is a name, Seventh-day Adventist, whether you're in the conference or in another Seventh-day Adventist organization, it's just a name. You have nothing more than a name. And Jesus doesn't even call you his unless you're living for him. So let's be Christ-like, brothers and sisters. Let's surrender our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray a prayer of surrender today, asking that you come and be honored in our lives. We want to honor you. We want to be filled without measure with your spirit. We want to get rid of all bitterness, all strife. We want to give our fears over to you, our, our, our uh, concerns that make us sometimes tempt us to compromise. We ask now that you accept us, Lord, and forgive us of our sins and make us your children. And this is our humble prayer in the precious name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Dismiss us will be our closing song. Dismiss us, Lord.